Purple Daily on Score North and scorenorth.com. The debut episode, Purple Daily on Draft. I'm very excited for this, fellas. This is our first episode of Purple Daily on Draft. We, we, Phil and I have been talking about how can we expand Purple Daily and you know make it more than just Mackie, Judd, and myself and Ventline, which is our core shows. Well, how about we have a year-long draft show? Draft uh, A show centered around draft prospects. Obviously, the mecca that is the NFL draft. I think I have said to both of you guys before, Tyler and, and Thor, that I find your guys' community, the mock draft community, like the most interesting community of sports collection I have ever seen. <laughs> like there's there's people who love analytics, which has been like kind of the big flavor over the last few years, obviously. Uh, you have your classic old school guys that just love to look at an eye test and whatnot. And then you have this entire community that is just devoted to the NFL draft. Like your guys' livelihood is like tied to analyzing draft picks. And to me, I don't know why, I just find it completely fascinating. Yeah, it's a community of sickos for sure. <laughs> I'm happy to be a part of it. We can uh, thank the godfather, Mel Kuyper Jr., for deciding he wanted to do this in the late 70s. And he's he's given us all a platform in order to be able to take this to a different level here it, uh, over the course of the next however many years. All right, fellas. So here's how this is going to work. And for the audience, I should say, uh, this is how this will work. This is Purple Daily on Draft. That is Thor Nystrom. That is Tyler Fornis. You guys recognize them from other Purple Daily related programmings and also just uh, other Vikings related content on Twitter. You can follow uh, Tyler at the Real Forno and at you can follow Thor. Excuse me at Thor K U. Uh, so we are going to break down NFL draft prospects, even some college football stuff when that starts up. That's the one wheelhouse that actually I have no uh, I have no wheelhouse in, if you will. But college football is the one thing I haven't gotten into. So I'm excited to pick your guys' brain once we get to college football season here in a few months to kind of look at potential prospects from there. So this is a year-long draft show. We'll focus on Vikings draft picks. We'll focus on NFL draft prospects uh, throughout the college football and NFL season. I'm really excited to talk about it. But boys... The Vikings are finally, it's finally here. The Vikings are about to be on the clock. It's NFL draft week. And I want to start you guys uh, with this one, because I know both of you guys have very strong opinions on this player, and you've, you've mentioned them before, whether it's Thor with us on Tuesdays, Tyler with Judd on Purple Access on Thursdays. The stock of CJ Stroud, which I feel like in the last 48 hours or so has kind of taken a dip. I feel like early on in the mockosphere towards the end of the NFL season, it, it looked like he was going to be the second QB at, at, off the board. And now it's anyone's game. He has that failed test a little bit. Uh, so I'll start you off with this one. Where do you guys think C.J. Stroud gets drafted when the first round rolls around on Thursday? Uh, Thor, I'll start with you on that one. Well, if I had to pick one slot, I, I I would predict four right now to the Colts. But that thing is still up in the air. And if if Levis is still on the board at the Colts, we know that the Colts like Levis. And so does their their owner in particular, Jim Irsay, took a real shine to him. So that's where it could get interesting and potentially even falls lower than that. But yeah, unless it's the greatest smoke screen of all time, Houston ain't taking him at two. Ty, what do you think, man? I, I really don't know where to peg Stroud. I mean, uh, Thor kind of laid it out nicely with the Colts. But I, I think if there's one quarterback that's going to quote unquote fall and I used air quotes in that I think it's going to be CJ Stroud people are going to overthink the Ohio State helmet just because we know NFL executives as smart as they are they fall victim to some of this stuff and like I love Stroud he's my he's my quarterback one in this class my number two overall player but you can look at him and be like okay where is the ceiling in comparison in comparison to the Bryce Youngs, the Anthony Richardsons, the Will Levis. And you could say that he's got the fourth highest ceiling just because what he's able to do isn't necessarily the most dynamic. He's just a brilliant technician. He can spray the ball to all levels of the field. And that S2 cognition test where you supposedly got an 18%, like Kevin Fielder on Vikings Wire earlier today, I'm, I'll plug my own site, he released a really well-done article breaking down how his decision-making like is just brilliant. And he is a problem solver on the field within the pocket and being able to utilize his arm to attack. And I, I think he's just going to get overthought. And I wouldn't be shocked if like a team trades up to like 10 to go get him. And then uh, Philly decides, hey, let's just stockpile another first round pick for next year to continue to build out this roster. I, I love Stroud. I would give move heaven and earth to go get him. But I think he's the guy that falls if one does. 
Quickly before I ask about how the Vikings' chances are, should the Vikings pursue him, what do you guys say or when, when you hear that Ohio State quarterbacks don't translate to the NFL? Like, what is your retort to that? Because, I mean, there is a case to be made that, right, like not a lot of Ohio State guys. I know Joe Burrow was there, but he obviously had his career at LSU that, that have his stock rose. What is it when people say Ohio State quarterbacks don't translate to the NFL and why should teams just stay away from them? Thor, like, why, why should the Vikings – or why should any NFL team take an Ohio State quarterback if those skills don't ever translate to the NFL level? Well, I, I would just say you have to scout the player, right? And you have to try to remove them from their circumstances, which, you know, we're talking about Stroud or other Ohio State quarterbacks. Typically, the the circumstances have been very good, and it's obviously a very quarterback-friendly scheme where you're surrounded by, by awesome talent. Or if you're talking about the other end of the spectrum, guys that come out of terrible situations and they have to sort of overcome that, whatever you have to sort of give them the benefit of the doubt. I understand interrogating CJ Stroud's evaluation. I totally do. Right. Like he was surrounded by the three stud receiver before in Columbus, the receiving room was so stacked that Jamison Williams had to transfer out his last season to Alabama so he could get on the field. And then CJ Stroud was playing behind this, this awesome offensive line too. So I, I totally get it. Like, you know, again, you have to scout the player. It, it's just, he is the most accurate with the best ball placement in this draft, just objectively. It just is what it is. Like that's not his, his players don't have magnets. There's not a magnet on the ball that's helping him do that or whatever. That just is what it is. But it, you know, like the fair thing about it, I think is like, they did have, they have the spread out field that, that, you know, that their system, and then you get the athletes into space. And so typically it's, it's the one-on-one -on -one thing. And I think what the NFL is asking is if he processes information slower, once the field becomes more condensed and once the, the athletes that he's throwing to don't have the advantage over every single guy defending him or them, then, you know, how, how is his decision-making going to be going from one to two to three but the thing is, in college, you can't have it both ways because, the you know, the, the other nitpick on his profile early on was like he wasn't bailing out of the pocket at the first sign of danger. And the reason why that you didn't get to see his athleticism as much, it's because he goes through the progressions, right? Like we saw that over and over again over his career. So you can't really have it both ways. The the news of that stuff didn't change him on my board at all. I I, I have him quarterback, too. But I have him the exact same place on my big board that Tyler does. He is number two on my big board. I ain't budging off that. Tyler, how about you, man? What do you kind of say when people say Ohio State quarterbacks don't translate to the NFL? I, I think it's a cop-out. And I, I think a lot of what Thor had to say kind of about what the offense that he ran under Ryan Day is, I think it makes some sense. I think it's too hard. Too quick to judge Justin Fields, especially with his translation in the NFL. I mean, look at the dumpster fire he walked into and what he had to do and adapt his game in order to have any form of success. I mean, that he was just put in a position to fail. And I think what you have to look at is you can't look at Joe Germain coming out in the 1999 draft of being a, a why C.J. Stroud is going to fail because, one, the com the systems are running are completely different too, and the game is completely changed. Like I think that helmet scouting is a really difficult one, but I think you can kind of correlate because like take a look when Patrick Mahomes was drafted in 2017, you never really had a successful quarterback in the National Football League come from the air raid. You had seen a lot of failures. Tim Couch went number one overall, where he actually played for Hal Mummy at Kentucky, and. You can at least be like, okay, they haven't succeeded because of X, Y, and Z because of this system and how difficult it translates. But then once one guy does, you can be like, okay, he translated because of these reasons. And now I see this with this guy and now I can help him translate. Unfortunately for Stroud, there's no actual evidence of a guy translating outside of Joe Burrow. And that's really not a good data example as far as having this conversation as Thor pointed out because his success was all at LSU with Joe Brady in a completely different style of offense. Like, I think you just have to look at the film and you have to understand, Hey, he does these things well. And I believe that they are going to translate to the national football league. The one real reservation I had is how Thor mentioned the spacing and college football, the hash marks are twice as wide. So you get a lot wider splits and college football athletes just aren't the same as the NFL. So you can get like your third wide receiver, Jackson Smith and Jigba, against a cornerback who wouldn't even make the practice squad in the USFL and just take him to school every single time. So contextualizing that, but the ball placement's tremendous. He can make every single throw. And Ryan Day legit asked him not to run the football. 
not to do a lot of those things and to stay in the pocket and be able to just light defenses up down the field. So I think the helmet scouting is lazy, but if you want to talk about no quarterbacks translated from this system, I think that's a much fairer conversation. So let's say he does fall. Let's say it's uh maybe it's four, but obviously it, it, it continues to fall out of the top five or so. Is he worth trading up for if you're the Minnesota Vikings? If you're Quasi Adolfa Mensa and let's say it gets to let's say let's just use Thor's example of pick four, because the Colts could be someone that they could take him, but let's say he's there at four. Is it worth mortgaging your next two first round picks and figuring out the draft chart um, you know, evaluation? Is it worth going up to number four to get CJ Stroud? Thor, what do you think? I think it's going to take him getting out of the top five. I think it would be six because the Colts certainly aren't going to trade down because we know that they're going to take a quarterback or whatever. But if, you know, he gets through then the Seahawks as well, because you could see the Seahawks pass and they just re up Geno Smith and they need all kinds of help on their defensive front. And there's going to be a couple blue chipper prospects available there. I, I, I think you start that train at six with Detroit. And we, we talked about how Quasi's already made two blockbuster trades with the lions in his brief time on the job. I, I think that's the one because then also you're hopping the Raiders uh, potentially. And then the price point, it's going to be more manageable, right? Like we had talked about with, with the, you know, if you trade up with the Cardinals to get to three, to hop some of these teams that are going to take quarterbacks, it's going to take your first and third this year and your next two first rounders is what I think the price would be. If, if he gets to six though, again, more manageable. It's, it's your first this year, maybe the third, but maybe you could talk them into a fourth this year and then your first next year. So you're saving your first in a couple of years. And way I see it is, is if you've already, ta- we know that they've talked to San Francisco about Kirk Cousins. If you have trade parameters worked out on that in advance, I think that you could essentially recoup next year's draft value that you trade out in the trade where you would trade up for Stroud by trading out Kirk Cousins, whether that's just a, you know, a first round pick or whether that's a second and a third or whatever, just something that would equal that. But I I think that's the path right there for, for me, he's got to get out of the top five and that's when you get aggressive. Tyler, what do you think? Is he worth trading up for number four? Are you kind of like with Thor that, Hey, it's probably gonna be happening later towards the back end of the top 10. How would you kind of pursue if you were Quasi? I'm going to look at this from two avenues. One, I would be comfortable moving up to three to go get him. I'm that confident that he is that kind of player that I believe he can lead this franchise for a long time. But we also don't exactly have a lot of precedent of teams trading out of the top five or even the top 10 and going all the way down to 23. Because as much as we want to talk about moving up, you have to talk about who's going to be willing to move down. And that is where I think the Vikings may not be able to actually get too deep into the top 10 with the trade. I think you're probably looking at Philly at 10 is probably that starting point. Um, the, the two trades that I found that are similar to what the Vikings are going to make in a jump, the Chiefs in trading up for Mahomes gave up a third and a first to go from 27 to 10. And the Falcons gave up two for, uh, an extra first, a second and two fourths to go from 27 to six to get Julio Jones. Mm. Like, and both the GMs of the Browns and Bills that end up making those trades, both didn't have a job within 24 months. So I really wonder if the Vikings are actually going to be able to trade up that far without doing like a Josh Allen thing where the Bills traded up from 22 to 12 by giving up their left tackle, um, Cordy Glenn. And then they got from 12 to seven with two second round picks. Like, unless the Vikings are going to be able to do something like that, I think 10 is probably the starting point. Because I think the Eagles could justify getting a, an extra first round pick because the talent gap between 10 and 23 is no going to be nowhere near as big as like five to 23. So let's say he does get out of the top 10, which I, I, I'm with you guys. I don't think that'll happen. I think someone is desperate enough that they will take him inside the top 10, but crazier things have certainly happened on draft day. Assumptions are made and stock just falls and the boards gets really weird. Let's say it is, you know, between. 10 and 13 and maybe the comp here guys would be the Justin Fields trade with the Bears right like you give up next year's first round pick and you know throw in a third it's not as uh not as daunting as giving up you know going all the way up to top four if that's the situation is it a no-brainer for the Vikings to go up and get them yeah and 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 I think I, I would be stunned if, if Stroud falls out of the top 10 but I think it would be fair to say if one of those top four quarterbacks falls out of the top 10 
because now you've increased your odds a little bit if you toss Richardson or Levis into that thing. I it seems like Levis ain't going to do that anymore. But I, I think there is a shot that one of those uh, four quarterbacks, obviously not Bryce Young, but one of them, uh, Coder or whatever. And yeah, the 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 cost at that point gets way more manageable. I mean, like you know, let's say you know Houston's pick at twelve, that pick is worth twelve hundred points by the trade chart. Vikings pick at twenty three is worth seven sixty. It, it's way easier to drive that the Vikings third round pick for, for those interested, it's worth 155 points. So obviously you're going to have to give up more than that. I would try to uh, protect my first round pick next year as best I could potentially. That That's why obviously the further it goes down, the price goes down. I don't know if you could save it in that trade. You know, could you convince them to take your second rounder next year? Uh, we'd have to see, but yeah, it, it becomes a lot, lot more manageable at that point. A team like Houston would love to trade down and pick up draft equity next year as well. I, I'm very intrigued to see how this quarterback class falls off the board. Um, Peter King's Football Morning in America article today had Hendon Hooker going at 12 to the Texans and Anthony Richardson going at 23 to the Vikings. So there, there's a – everybody is so all over the board with these quarterbacks. I'm very intrigued to see how they come off the board because a lot of the people that are hyping up Hendon Hooker just happen to also be with CAA, the same agency. <laughs> so you can kind of link those together and – what about a guy like Richardson falling? Like if a guy makes it to like eight, I think you really need to start being aggressive with those phones and a, an interesting element to add. I know it'll add about 6 million in dead cap, but with the moves you're going to make with uh, Zadarius Smith and Dalvin cook, you'll be in theory. Fine. Daniel Hunter could be an interesting trade trip for a move up here. And I don't necessarily, I'm not going to pound the table saying, I think it's a great idea, but if you hit on the quarterback, I don't know if there's too much of a price to pay realistically to go get that player. And I think uh, adding a guy like Hunter at 29 years old, who is still in the prime of his career, could be a very intriguing asset for a team. I like it. All right, fellas. So the Vikings are on the board, obviously, at 23 for now. We'll certainly see if they uh, if they end up trading up for that quarterback. They stay put at 23 or they trade back. I think the most likelihood is they do trade back. But I also want to talk about day two picks here. I know we're, we've been previewing quarterbacks. We've been talking a ton of first round picks. Let's also talk about day two of the draft. So the Vikings only have, as of now, again, uh, one first, uh, one third round pick. They have no picks in the second round. Uh, let's say the Vikings take best player available in their first round selection, and they have a couple day two picks now at their disposal. What are you looking for the Vikings to do on day two of the draft? And and I will help you out by saying they take a, let's call it a wide receiver, because that's been the one that's also been mocked. Let's say they take a wide receiver in round one, and they have a couple more now picks to play with on day two. Where do you want to see the what do you want to see the Vikings do in rounds two and three? Thor, I'll go to you. Yeah, well, they don't have the second round pick, unfortunately, because of the Hawkinson trade. So if you're staying put and you don't trade down, then you're not picking again until that, that third round slot. They go receiver in first round. For me, it would be either nose tackle or a cornerback. Um, pending the resolution with the, the Daniel Hunter stuff, because, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on in, in, in the room there. And I didn't say it at a uh, Holiday Inn Express last night. But, you know, you know barring that, the, the nose tackle, I think, would be important. You know, a guy that could potentially start over Tonga or just rotate in with Tonga, that war daddy in the middle. You know, like the the stamina of those guys, not the best. So potentially that Siaki Ika uh, kid from Baylor would be a guy to look at there. In the Like, he was a guy that was getting mocked in the first round, you know, starting from a year ago in the two early mocks all the way through into the season, but has fallen since. Doesn't have a great wingspan for one of those, those war daddy guys. And some of the counting stats aren't as good, but he is fabulous at occupying blockers. He can get off them if he's single teamed as well. He pushed the pocket a little bit at Baylor, but in turn, like he can occupy multiple guys on any run play. He, so he's one of those linebacker best friend types. He, he would be a potential guy in that third round slot or else just the best corner that fell down to you or nickel defender that fell down to you. Uh, one sort of sneaky guy with that would be Antonio Johnson from Texas A&M who actually may fall down a bit because uh, he struggled a bit last season. He, he It's funny, Antonio Johnson was actually better than Brian Branch as a sophomore. It's just that Brian Branch blew up as a junior and Antonio Johnson regressed a little bit. But he's one of the, the guys, Antonio Johnson, that you want to play closer to line of scrimmage because he's like an extra linebacker enforcer. 
type nickel, whereas Branch is like sort of that all around guy. But if he falls down, he he would be another guy to look at, or just one of the best corners that that fell down. And luckily, you know, in this draft, and and this might benefit the Vikings to look at, for instance, receiver. It's one of the reasons I was banging the drum, you know, during this process for the the receiver at twenty three is because this cornerback class, one of the better corner classes that we've had come out in a couple of years. Obviously, the Vikings need that, but the depth of that thing should go through the third round. So whether you're talking about like. Um, uh, well, Terrell Smith is a guy, at least I would consider there the, the local kid. I don't know how high they are on him, but he blew up last season and he has the, the athletic measurables to, to go with that stuff. Um, if Clark Phillips falls down there from Utah, another guy that was being mocked first round in the too early stuff, but his measurables, uh, you know, failed to impress smaller package guy. You'd have to put him in, in the nickel. Um, it, so then you'd have to move Murphy outside, but as long as it com- the Vikings were comfortable doing that, could be another guy that they look at. Tyler, how about you, man? I think if you get a wide receiver in round one, which is something I've been pounding the table for for over a year, I wanted to go round one last year at wide receiver just because I knew this was coming from Thielen, and I'm not the highest on KJ Osborne. He's fine, but I really don't think he's a he's a future number two for this organization. Hold on, I, I, I got to DM KJ Osborne what you're saying right now. Just one second. <laughs> <laughs> Get clapped. Yeah, still the, he's still a good player but there there's there's just a, a difference in in that gap for me um and if you get that wide receiver you can really do a lot of different things um i think running back is a sneaky play in round three i don't necessarily think that it's it's the right play this running back class is deep and i think you can get a guy who's a potential starter in round five like this this running back class just has a lot of different types in it and it seems like the vikings want to build a deep running back room where you have guys to be able to do a little bit of everything. And it kind of reminds me of how the Eagles built the running back room last year. They had three different types of backs. And I think the Vikings are going to try to do the same. I love uh, cornerback Darius rush in round three, uh, real big physical guy. I think he has a higher upside than cam Smith, but a much wider variance of outcomes. He loses a lot early in reps. And he showed that at the senior bowl. He's just, He gets beat off the line of scrimmage, but his recovery speed and football IQ are tremendous. He's good in press coverage. And if you can fix some of those early in the route areas where he just struggles, I think that that's a guy that you can kind of blossom into a future starter. And you have like, I think in a similar way to what they viewed a Caleb Evans as a guy that you could potentially count on long-term to be that guy. I like the Antonio Johnson idea. Um, especially with how like the linebacker position has changed. It's a lot of smaller guys and the versatility element is something Brian Flores continues to pound the table for. You have to be able to do multiple things on his defense. You have to be able to blitz cover and, and be, be a little bit rangy. And even though Johnson's not a center fielder, he can do a lot of those things and being able to add that versatility would be awesome. Um, I still think even though um, Thor's not a hundred percent sold on it, I think edge is a sneaky, sneaky need for this team because Zedaria Smith is probably gone this weekend. And then outside of him, the only two guys on the roster are uh, Patrick Jones and Luigi Villain for 2024. What is this room going to look like? They obviously signed Marcus Davenport to give him an extension, but you still have to see it and he has to prove it in order to get that extension. So I think edge could really be in play. I really like Carl Brooks from Bowling Green. He's going to be more of like a hand in the dirt guy. He struggles in the in the run game, but he's a 300 pound guy who is just an incredible pass rusher. And one thing I really like is for a guy who's 300 pounds, he's got a decent bend. And I think that kind of versatility, you could stand him up in some really weird packages where you put like Hunter and Davenport like in the A gaps, or even have them with their hand in the dirt. And I like that element. And the third round, I think, is going to be a really interesting spot for defenders because there's going to be a lot of guys that end up falling there that shouldn't be there. And if the Vikings end up with a second-round pick, um, I like Thor's idea of a nose tackle. Mozzie Smith, the most athletic guy on Bruce Feldman's freaks list last year. He needs to learn how to keep his pad level lower, but you can't teach a guy at 330 pounds to be able to do the things he does. He ran a better three-cone than Aiden Hutchinson last year, and just his athleticism is just – absolutely phenomenal and that's a guy that you would want to teach and you can teach a guy to be a little bit lower with his leverage you can't teach freak athleticism and i think flores would be very intrigued by that on the defensive 
Go ahead. Oh, I was Go just going to jump and respond to a couple of those things. I, I actually have Darius Rush 58th on my board. So if he got down to the third round, absolutely, I'm popping him there. A guy who had jumped up this past season. He was in Cam Smith's shadow during his time at South Carolina, but his game ticked way up this year. And he just absolutely dominated the pre-draft process. Was one of the best mm-hmm. corners in Mobile at the Senior Bowl and was tracked as the fastest overall player in terms of max speed at the senior ball when they put the chips on you and then track you with the zebra thing. And then he went to the, the combine during his pre-draft process, proved the concept of all that, that he's a really good athlete and, and profiles as that outside press man guy. Um, so, so like that one, I, I, I liked what Tyler brought up too, about the running back thing. Uh, Dex and our, our, uh, our, group thread that we we have uh I, I mentioned to you guys that a little birdie had told me that the vikings have worked out trade parameters with an afc team for a delvin cook trade that would come after june 1st it'll be mm-hmm. interesting to see if the vikings are willing to sort of wait on that bird in the hand or to save money is the reason why you wait on it you know it's yeah. like four million dollars more or something like that in cap savings if you trade them after that or you know, is there going to be a trade possibility presented to them on draft weekend where they're like, us, you know, F it. We're, 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 we're going to take the, you know, we'll take the extra $4 million hit or whatever. But either way, if you're already planning to have a roster without Delvin, you got to draft a running back at some point in this draft, you know, like to, to mix in there with, with Madison and Chandler. You don't want to go into the season next year with those guys and then whatever you could get from Mwangu. I, I want Mwangu more as the return guy. So, yeah, I, you know, th- that's a middle round possibility for sure. Is uh is Ty J Spears a guy in round two or three, or is that a little bit more of a reach? I know Thor, you were high on him. Both of you guys saw him at the combine or at the uh, at, at the Senior Bowl. Uh, what do you guys think about that as a potential starting running back for the Vikings? If he gets down to round three, absolutely. I you know I, on my board, I think I have him as a very high. Uh, sec- I have him sixty fifth overall. So a ve- that's the second pick in the third round. If he got down mm-hmm. to the Vikings pick, absolutely. And there's a shot that he gets down there. Right. Like because some of the nitpicks on his profile, uh, well, maybe not nitpicks, maybe the legitimate, you know, some people think they're legitimate concerns, but two knee injuries in the past. So your medical team will have to sign off on that. But that's one reason he could filter down a little bit. And then also he wasn't used on third downs at Tulane, which may have just been a usage thing to try to keep his touches down because he got a lot of work on first and second down. Certainly at the senior ball, he showed really soft hands. And he was shaking people out of their boots on on the routes, which you wouldn't have assumed because you just didn't see it much uh, on his college film. But for those reasons, that's how he could end up filtering into like the, the late third round. And yeah, if he's there and again, like the Vikings have either the trade worked out or they plan to work out the trade to send Delvin out. I would absolutely take Tajay Spears in the third round. Forno, how about you? Are you looking at Spears? Is there another back maybe in rounds two or three that you could also look at potentially? I love Spears, but uh, I'm a much bigger Zach Charbonnet guy. He's my third running back, and Spears is at four. <laughs> He's my second. Get, I, I love Charbonnet. Get a nice run in from Mac he ain't going to be there, though, Mac. I don't think. Yeah. I, I, here's the thing with this running back class, Thor, and I want your take on it. I really don't know how these guys are coming off the board because you're getting Bijan and Gibbs one, two in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. After that, it's really going to be a pick your poison. What type of back do you want? You could see a guy like Charbonnet falling to mid round three just because he's a bigger bruiser. He would just fit right into a 1995 Chicago Bears team. But <laughs> at the end of the day, he doesn't quite have that next level burst and explosiveness that a guy like Spears has. And is a team going to want to prefer that? I think Charbonnet's game is so well rounded and he's got enough burst to get through the hole. He just doesn't have that home run long speed. And quite frankly, I'm okay with a bunch of 40 yard runs if they don't turn into 60 because he offers such a versatile package and can do just a little bit of everything. Um, he's a guy that I would target. One guy that really intrigues me after round three at any point on day three is Deuce Vaughn, the shortest guy to ever go to the combine at just over five foot five. But he plays so much bigger. He can block linebackers and pass protection. He can catch the ball. He can run. He's explosive. He can do a little bit of everything, and he's going to go late like his his alma mater, Darren Sproles, did. But I think that a guy that can do a little bit of everything, at a certain point, size doesn't matter, and you just take the guy you can play ball, and that's Deuce Vaughn. I love it. Uh, Offensive linemen. So I know the Vikings have their starting offensive line. They're probably going to run it back, the same thing they had last year. Obviously, the interior is still the shaky part. Assuming Brian O'Neill comes back, obviously him and Darius are two of the better tackle tandems in the NFL, too. Is there a path for the Vikings to take another interior guard on day two of the draft? Are you just kind of satisfied with what the Vikings got? 
Is there an alignment that you would be worth pursuing? Is there an alignment worth pursuing, basically, on day two of the draft? Four and all, actually. I'll, I'll start with you. I think there are some interesting options on day two, but considering the wealth of needs that the Vikings have elsewhere, I don't necessarily see it being their smartest ploy. I will say that I wouldn't be shocked if Ezra Cleveland ends up getting traded at some point this weekend. I, I haven't heard anything, but he's on the last year of his deal. It would save almost $3 million in cap space. And it it sounds like he may want to go play tackle. Um, and the Vikings probably aren't going to want to pay him the $10 million or so that he's going to warrant in free agency. So moving on from getting capital might be a smart play. Then you got to look at guys like TCU, Steve Avila, um, um, whatchamacallit, Wisconsin's Joe Tippman. Those are a couple guys. Maybe an Osiris Torrance if he ends up falling but I don't expect him to get out of the first round. There's some interesting options, but more so at center than at guard. And I think, especially with the gear of Bradbury extension, I'm not 100% sure how that would translate. I think Avila is going to be fine at guard. He played some of that at TCU. But I I don't see interior offensive line being picked at all unless the Vikings end up with like eight picks in the draft and Quasey just wheels and deals. Thor? Well, I, I just don't know that, you know, in terms of the draft equity, which Tyler was sort of pointing at the end of his, his comments there, like w- with the lack of draft equity, that that's the only thing that I question with that. Certainly, if you can trade down, you can pick up more picks. But with the only the five and you have, you know, X amount of roster holes, I think mm-hmm. that's where it it, get, it gets pushed out. I like the idea of adding depth or adding an air apparent there or even adding insurance for, for our buddy Ed Ingram and, you know, see, you know, is his game going to jump up or not? Um, you know, just having insurance there, developmental guy, whatnot. But yeah, like we're w- with the picks as constituted right now. Um, I, I don't know that they'll end up taking an offensive lineman just because of that. I gotcha. Uh, fellas, last takes here before we get up on the draft. So obviously round one's on Thursday, got the Vikings on the clock at 23. We previewed round two. We can get to the meat and potatoes, like maybe uh, on w- once we actually break things down uh, when the day three of the draft takes place this Saturday. But any uh, last takes from uh, from the Vikings draft side of things before uh, they actually make their pick this Thursday? Oh, man. Well, I, tune in and get your popcorn ready because I think this is going <laughs> to be the craziest draft like in the last decade. We're, we're, you know, you're, you're only days away now. Nobody has any idea, not only who's going second, we don't know who's picking second. And it, the same thing goes for three. And then, you know, obviously at the top of the board, if you don't know, everything after that changes, whatnot. So th- this is one of the hardest seasons to do mock drafts, draft draft processes that I can remember. Um, and it, it's going to be the, the team that does the best in this. It's who works the best in that chaos. Because in these unforeseen scenarios, let's say a Stroud falls down or, or uh, Richardson falls down or whatever, unexpectedly, if they start falling down, who can seize the moment within that sort of chaotic atmosphere? And I trust Kwesi, at, le- at least what we've seen from him early, to sort of suss out the situation and keep his, his head about him as as all the, the winds are swirling around and stuff. So I, I that's the thing I would keep an eye on. The Vikings are going to be making multiple trades this weekend. Some could, could include veteran players like Tyler was mentioned. And so, yeah, strap up. I love it. Tyler, last takes, man. Uh, man, I, I cannot wait. Um, I, I do a, uh, for Vikings Wire, a in-depth uh, um, tracker throughout the industry where I take all, all the, the top industry analysts and uh, I aggregate their mock drafts and kind of keep track. Over 436 mock drafts since the Viking, since January 1st. The Vikings have been sent 54 different players. That kind of tells you what uh, analysts in the industry think of this draft class. Nobody really has any idea w- of what is going on. And I think the Vikings are either going to trade up or they're not picking before pick 30. Like, I, I don't see them a situation, them picking at 23, unless that quarterback ends up falling to them. But at a certain point with Quasey's uh, ability to wheel and deal, I would be surprised if he doesn't actually execute a trade up. But we're in for a wild ride. And there's a there's a good chance we don't pick it all on Thursday night. And it's it's going to be fascinating to see who ends up going up for who and who the Vikings end up at, with at quarterback because they're going to get one at some point over the three days. We just have no clue who. Awesome stuff, fellas. Tyler, Thor, appreciate it. This is Purple Daily on Draft. This is our debut episode. You can find these episodes every Monday right here on the Purple Daily YouTube channel. This will be a 52-week, uh, 365-day-a-year, I guess. 
Uh, there'll be a year-round podcast right here on Purple Daily, Apple, Spotify, the Purple Daily YouTube channel where you want to see the Vikings win a Super Bowl before we die. More draft content coming at you later this week. And, of course, the uh, Surly Draft Party at Park Tavern here locally in the Twin Cities in St. Louis Park. We're excited to talk to and uh, meet as many Vikings fans as possible as well, figure out what the Vikings are indeed going to do on Thursday. Hit that subscribe button for Daily Minnesota Vikings Entertainment. This has been Purple Daily on Draft.